Now, the issue that we're debating tonight concerns bodily resurrection. And what this means, of course, is that Jesus came back from the dead, not just as a spirit, but as an actual physical body. It was, of course, a rather special physical body, because as you will know, it was one that was able to pass through walls, as St. John says. And the way in which I'm going to pursue the question, in fact, a way in which I think it's mandatory to pursue the question, is simply on the basis of what empirical evidence there is uh, for settling this issue. Is there sufficient evidence for us to believe that Jesus did rise bodily from the dead, or if there is no sufficient empirical evidence, then we should either suspend belief and remain in a state of doubt, or we should positively believe that the event didn't happen. Now, I'm not going to be concerned particularly, at least not at this stage, with minute analysis of the historical data. I'm going to allow quite wide latitude for what historical data we admit. In fact, I'm going to admit quite a lot. I'm going to suppose, though in fact this isn't true, that we have a great deal of contemporary written testimony about the resurrection. I'm going to suppose, though this isn't true, that the testimony was written by people who were entirely unbiased, all of them, who were skeptical and highly educated, um, and I'm, I'm going to assume uh, that we've got no other reasons for doubting what they say, other than the content of what they say. I claim that even then, we don't have a case for the resurrection that is worth a second look. Now, the first argument for this, I'm going to give three arguments for this claim. The first argument for this claim is the one that's listed as the first argument on your handout. And rather than go through it, I'm going to start by presenting an analogy in order to illustrate it. So let's imagine, uh, in the first case, that you have a pitcher of water, say a bucket of water, and you have a thermometer with which to measure it. Well, better, let's imagine not just that you have one, but that you have four or five thermometers with which to measure its temperature. And you put the thermometers in the bucket of water, and they say that it's 10 degrees C. And you put your hand in, and it feels quite cool, so you think, okay, that's, that's probably right. But now imagine that the thermometers say that the temperature was 30 degrees C. Now, you might put your hand in and think that's a bit odd, because it's quite cool, indeed cooler than I normally feel water at that temperature to be, but nevertheless, maybe it's because there's something wrong with, with the way in which I detect heat by touch, and probably all of these thermometers are correct. Let's now suppose that the, thermometers re the thermometer readings are that the water is at a temperature of 600 degrees C, and that the water is still in its liquid state. Now, in that case, I don't think, in spite of the evidence, the independent evidence of all of these thermometers, I don't think you would say, ah, look, we've got water that isn't boiling, that's at 600 degrees C. What you would say is that we need to get a new thermometer. The reason that you would say that is, of course, this. We have never observed water, boiling, water not boiling at temperatures significantly above 100 degrees C at sea level. We have frequently observed thermometers going wrong. Therefore, the more likely hypothesis on the basis of the evidence we have is that the thermometer has gone wrong than that the water is at a liquid state, is in a liquid state at 600 degrees centigrade. Now, I hope the point of the analogy is clear, but let me just show how it applies to the argument at hand. We have frequently observed, the first thing I'll say is that we have frequently observed and verified beyond doubt that there are cases where skeptical, highly educated, independent witnesses testify to something that didn't happen. Now, the case I'm going to mention, this is, this is the one scholarly citation that I hope to have to make tonight. The case that I'm going to mention is one in a well-known study by Robert Buckhout in 1974, in which what happened was that he staged an assault on a university professor in California in front of 141 independent student witnesses. So these were highly educated people with no bias. Seven weeks later, not 10 years or five years, or however late it is that our first written testimony of the, uh, of the resurrection is, seven weeks later, he asked the students to identify the attacker, giving them a, a set of photographs. 60% of the people he asked positively identified the wrong person including the victim of the attack itself. Now, there aren't, it's not just cases like that. There are dozens of other cases, including rather tragic real-life ones, where people have been convicted on the basis of independent eyewitness testimony. Um, and as it turns out, from later forensic evidence, the conviction was wrong. So we have clear cases where we have much better eyewitness testimony than we could possibly have had for the resurrection, which has turned out to be wrong. 
Now, moving on to number three, this is the third assumption, premise on the, on the first argument. Something we have never observed, ever, except possibly in the one case under dispute, and we can't assume that now, something we have never observed is either of these two things happening. The first one is that bodies come back to life after three days. We have never observed that. The second one is that solid bodies pass through solid rock. Certainly solid bodies the size of human beings have never been observed to pass through solid rock. These are things we have never, ever observed. It is therefore reasonable to suppose that it is more likely that in this case, the case of the resurrection, where the witness testimony is worse than in the Buckhat case, case I described earlier, it is more likely that the witnesses got it wrong than that the resurrection actually occurred. Let me move on now to the second argument. The second argument is based on an assumption. I'll allow a certain assumption. I don't believe it's true, but let just, let's just suppose that it is true. Let's suppose that we've ruled out conclusively all the possible um, naturalistic explanations, that is, ones not involving supernatural intervention, all the possible naturalistic explanations for the evidence that we do have for the resurrection. Now, there are a variety of, a variety of such explanations. There's the theory that Jesus didn't really die when he was taken down from the cross. There's the theory that his body was stolen. There's the theory that there was a mass hallucination. There's the theory that they just all made it up. There are quite a few theories, but let's just suppose that we've conclusively refuted all of them. Many people say, for instance, nowadays, many people say that the theory, what's called the swoon theory, that is the theory that he didn't die on the cross, that theory is nonsense, because it can be conclusively proved that somebody, or well, it's, it's incredibly unlikely that somebody who was crucified in the manner that the Romans did it would have survived it. Indeed, there may be only one case. There's one case I think Josephus mentions, but there's no other known case where somebody survives crucifixion. I do find it slightly surprising that the very people who are so insistent that you can't survive crucifixion that a body can't survive, survive crucifixion, then happily go on to say that a body can survive death, but be that as it may. We'll move on to the, the argument. There are many cases where we find a phenomenon which has no known natural explanation, which later turns out to have a perfectly good one. Now, in some cases, that's just because we're ignorant of the facts, and later we discover certain historical facts that we didn't know at the time. In other cases, it's because we've discovered some new physical theory. These two cases aren't particularly... The difference between these two cases doesn't matter for my purposes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Nobody knew how the pyramids were built for a long time. and Some people thought that that was evidence for either supernatural intervention or UFOs. Recently, we've discovered roughly how the pyramids were indeed built. Another example is the phenomenon of meteors. So rational and enlightenment person as Thomas Jefferson once said that he would sooner believe that the professors who testified to the existence of meteors, he would sooner believe that they were lying than that stones should fly from the sky. And many other people believe that it was a miraculous or supernatural event. We now know, of course, that there's a perfectly good natural explanation for meteor strikes, and although really noticeable ones are rare, nevertheless we can understand why they happen. Another example is lightning. Until Benjamin Franklin, many people thought that lightning was, again, some sort of supernatural phenomenon, but now we know it's simply a, a form of electricity. Now, let's think in particular about the case of hallucination. I'm not advocating the hallucination theory. I'm simply using it for illustrative purposes. There's plenty of things that we don't know about how the human mind works. Indeed, it's almost certain that the amount that we don't know about how the human brain and the human mind work far outweighs the amount that we do know or that we even have an inkling of. Isn't it therefore reasonable to suppose that, hallucination might be an example, that there is some unknown natural explanation for the evidence that we have for the resurrection, rather than that there is a supernatural one? In all other cases where all known natural explanations have been ruled out, we've discovered that there was a then unknown natural explanation. That is therefore evidence on the basis of experience that this is what's happened in this case. Indeed, many Christians believe that God has made a very complex but very beautiful universe and that it's for us to discover its laws, though they be hidden from us. And somebody might adopt that attitude and indeed take also an attitude of what I think is the appropriate humility and suspend belief about the resurrection because he could say, well, there may be a natural explanation for the evidence, the evidence being the testimony of people like Paul, 
There may be an explanation for that, but we just don't yet know what it is. It does not follow that the explanation has to be supernatural. Let me move on now to my third argument. I'm now going to suppose the second argument admitted, though I don't think it's true, that all known explanations for the resurrection or for the testimony for the resurrection have been conclusively ruled out. The third argument goes further. Let's suppose that I was wrong, okay? Let's suppose that not only is there no known natural explanation for the evidence that we have, namely the testimony that we have from St. Paul and others, there's no known natural explanation for that, and in fact, let's suppose there's no explanation at all that can be given by science. So let's suppose we've conclu proved conclusively, I don't know how on earth we could do it, but let's suppose that we've proved conclusively that not only science in its present state, but science in any possible future state could not explain the data that we have for postulating Jesus' bodily resurrection. Even then, I think we don't have grounds for believing that it took place. My reasoning for this is as follows. If we're allowed in postulating hypotheses that would explain what the disciples say they saw, or what Paul says the disciples say they saw, and if we're, al if we're allowed in explaining that to suspend certain regularities that we've observed, to, we've observed all the time, for instance, the regularity that solid bodies don't pass through rock, if we're allowed to suspend such laws as that, who's to say which ones we can suspend? And who's to say which ones we can't? Let me give you some examples. It has been said, there is a report in St. Paul that Jesus appeared not only himself, St. Paul, though that was last of all, but also before the disciples and also before 500. Now you might say that that was a hallucination and the argument that it wasn't a hallucination is something like this, that 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once. But the reason for thinking 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once is because we've never observed it. So given the evidence that we have, we have to drop, thank you, we have to drop one of two uh, general statements that we've observed. One of them is that bodies don't come back to life and solid objects don't pass through rock. The second one, which we could also drop, is that people don't have collective hallucinations. One of these two is false, okay, if we're allowed to assume some supernatural explanation, let's suppose one of these two might be false, but who's to say which one we're to drop? Maybe there was a supernatural hallucination. So Jesus didn't really come back bodily from the dead. All of these people merely hallucinated that he did. I'm not saying it's likely, not at all. All I'm saying is that we've got no better reason to doubt that hypothesis than we have to doubt the hypothesis that he actually arose bodily from the dead. Both hypotheses go against everything we've experienced. So if we're willing to drop you know, beliefs about everything we've experienced, it seems to be either one could be dropped. So you've got no better reason to believe in bodily resurrection than in supernatural hallucination. That means I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude this argument. Exactly the same point apply, could, could apply to one of thousands of supernatural explanations. Maybe Jesus was kidnapped by Satan, who then put something else, somebody else who looked like Jesus in his place, and he was the one who appeared to everyone. That explains the evidence. That's a supernatural explanation. Why is that not to be preferred to the other supernatural explanations we've got? My point is that once you're in the game, of dropping statements that we've seen to be confirmed by experience every day, for instance, that solid objects don't pass through rock, you can drop any one that you like. 